when we start to teach, it's really tempting to try to make it our own form of teaching. But there's a problem with this when it comes to tranquil wisdom in, in, in um, you know, tranquil wisdom, medit insight meditation. And uh, this is just human nature that we want to do this. Nothing wrong with this, but I want to bring it to anybody's teaching, anybody's attention who's trying to teach because it was, it was always brought to my attention constantly by Bonte when I was in training. It was really easy to lose twim in history, tranquil wisdom, insight, meditation. Just as easy as it is to kill a recipe by substituting only one ingredient in the recipe. And I've told you guys before maybe about the bran muffins. <laughs> There's a recipe that was given to us on the farm where I was living with two, two families, you know, at one time. And we had this recipe and we only had the recipe written down. We did not know at the time it was a Wesson oil cookbook that the recipe came from. Wesson oil bran muffins. That sounds a silly story, but the bran muffins, they had flour in them. They had butter in them. They had the oil, of course, the oil in them. And they had a flavoring and they had uh, something else, but five or six ingredients basically for any kind of bread or cake. Well, the problem was when we took the recipe back home from where we got it, we couldn't make the bran muffins. Now, at the time, <laughs> we had three pigs on the farm. And so we made the recipe and it turned out like goo and we gave it to the pigs. And then we, we tried to bake it longer and it came out like rock and we gave it to the pigs. And we did it again <laughs> and it came out, but it tasted terrible. It wasn't at all like what we had been given where we got this recipe. And finally, I called her and I said, Olive, you've got to tell me what's wrong with this picture. And she said, OK, what kind of oil are you using? Well, we're using a very clean vegetable oil when we made this bran muffin. Well, that's the problem. You didn't use Wesson oil. So they had invented a recipe that came out perfectly as long as you use the ingredients specifically the way you were told in the recipe. They skipped the oil. It doesn't come out. We did it about maybe 17 times altogether to bake this. Everybody was laughing at us. So that's the thing. And you either make it more complex and more difficult, or it just stops working. And people are not advancing as fast as when we're teaching you. It's not because we're anybody special. No, that's not what it's about. It's about all the time that was spent to do it in a very specific way. So if we don't carefully choose another word, if we're going to choose another word, that is precisely a synonym, then our instructions will fail. And I heard from one teacher in the States, things are very, very, very slow with progress. And I, I can't figure out until I read some of the stuff the students were writing. And then I began to understand this is the problem. We have to try not to open the that brings in doubt, because doubt is one of the things that people can really get stuck with. So that's that's the difficulty. Now, the seal of themselves, we're looking at five basic precepts, five precepts. That's all we're asking the average person, five precepts, that's all you have to keep. And everything can work fine, and you can get as high as the attainments and start doing the, um, working on sodapana really seriously and sodapana and so, uh, fruit fruition, sakadagami and fruition. The sila themselves are a perfect example of this. And let's look at what happened to the precepts so that you understand in modern times, what is it happened to these precepts? Well, first of all, they you have to ask yourself what 
people do this all the time, you know, what do the precepts really have to do with meditation? And the, the answer today, you have to know who you're speaking to. That's difficult. If you're writing me an email and you ask me that question, it's difficult for me to know what to say back because um, they don't mean anything much at all if you are just doing it to relax and have relaxation from stress at work. They'll help you a little, but if you're talking to a person that's just doing this to relax and feel better at work, they're going to take them and they're going to be sloppy with them. And it's like, you know, I'm getting to the point where, okay, that's fine. But they're coming to stop, sit still, don't move at all. You're giving them something to do with loving kindness. That's good. That's good. That'll help them. But the point is when they go home, they think the precepts are just for when you're training them. I think that's what's going on with this idea. These are only training precepts. They are not training and life precepts. And first of all, I found that phrase this morning when I was going through the suttas. I found a sutta said these monks were told uh, uh, very straight up these are the precepts the basic precepts and they are for training and for life well they took end for life off and said they're for training i even had a nun in training come to me and say well you know those are just for when we're training well, I, I was perplexed. You put robes on and you're going to be a nun. And now you're telling me that the precepts are just for when you're training. Nope. Doesn't work that way. You can forget about training to go to any real results unless you're taking this all very seriously. But you first have to understand what they are. Okay. So, but if you're desiring to know what the Buddhist meditation really was all about, then you have to consider how meditation can affect your heart and your head and your actions. And you keep this in mind all the time. That's why they give you the precepts so often. But let's look at, look at this, uh, the Sheila, the five basic precepts, uh, are a perfect example of this whole thing, how things get changed. So you understand what's happening. We're not insane. We're just taking you back to the original look at things. So first of all, this is what it basically you're going to find written uh, in the book, in most of the suttas, okay? Do not kill or harm any living being on purpose. You know, we say on purpose. Re why do we say on purpose? Because we don't want you to get emotional about stepping on an ant so badly you have a nervous breakdown on the way to work. Seriously. Or if you stepped on that spider because they terrify you in the kitchen, just because you didn't catch it in, in a jar and put it out the window, we, it's the end of your life. No, that's not the end of your meditation career. Okay. <laughs> We want you to get reasonable with all this. All right. Second one, do not take what is not freely given. That's what we say to you because that's what this means. And that came from, gosh, we said what is not freely given just instead of do not steal. There's a reason for that. I'll explain it in a minute. Okay. Okay. Um, number three is do not engage in any wrong sexual activity. Now, what this really means is no sexual activity without the permission of the two people involved, but also do not do this with someone who is too young. And the next part is, or with a woman who is still in the care of their parents. In other words, they're not living on their own and you decide to do this with a woman who is living still with their parents. And I'll show you why that's important. May you have to remind me to show this part about the parents. I'm going to forget in a second. And I'm not going to do it right away. But I need to show you what happens. The question is, what happens when you um, decide to have a, do something in a sexual relationship with somebody who is living with their parents without their parents' awareness of it and stuff like that. What is going to happen? So I want to show you that. And the bottom line of the whole purpose of the third precept 
is you don't want to cause any suffering, mental or physical, with that person or anybody surrounding that person at all, because that's going to be your restlessness, guilt, and remorse that starts to set in when the whole thing explodes. But I'll show you how it works in a drawing. Okay, now, the next one is do not tell lies. And the actual whole precept is do not tell lies. Engage in, gr in gossip or slander or use harsh language. That's what's covered in that precept for real. I'm going to read it to you in a minute. And the fifth one is do not partake of any drugs or alcohol. And we say any recreational drugs or alcohol because this was another one. Some people thought they wanted to be perfect, so they were never going to take medicine again because all medicines, no matter how sick you are, are based and made with alcohol, which is burned off, but you can't convince them. And then they don't want to take their medicine. Then they get sick and bad things happen. Okay. So look at what we have uh let's read this first this one section i want you to go if you have the majima nikai go to page 449 and i want you to it's in it's in sutta number 51 it's called the kandaraka sutta to kandaraka now actually uh, this is an example of how very carefully, and that's what people miss, the words very carefully, you could take a sutta like this that was written, predominantly written to monks about the precepts, but pertaining to the five precepts in this section 14 is where we're going to start reading, okay? And, um, it's being addressed to monks, but I want you just to listen to this because it's a it's really a good description of the whole precept in each of the five precepts. It goes like this, having thus gone forth, now see that's the monk, but having thus decided to be a lay person, you can say to yourself, abandoning the killing of living beings you abstain from killing living beings on purpose. You don't do that anymore. With rod and weapon laid aside, conscientious and merciful, these things you learn in, in Brahma Viharas, he abides compassionate to all living beings. The second one is abandoning the taking of what is not given, abstaining from taking what is not given taking only what is given, expecting what is given, okay? By not stealing, he abides in purity. Are you attempting to do purification of your mind? So you're attempting to do that. This is your purity. Abandoning in celibacy, he observes celibacy, living apart. Now, you don't have to do that one. As a lay person, you don't have to do that one. That's not one of the five, abstaining from uh, totally having relations. All right. The next one is abandoning false speech. This is perfectly set up. He abstains from false speech. That's lying. He speaks truth, adheres to the truth, is trustworthy and reliable. One who is no deceiver of the world. You're not going to try to deceive anybody in into buying a particular kind of grill. There was a grill in the summertime one time. I had a student, he was selling these grills. I'm not going to mention the name of the grill. He was selling them all summer. And even before the end of the summer, they were falling apart. And he was a very successful salesperson who decided to sell these grills. Then he felt so bad about it. By the end of the summer, he quit the company. That was just a perfect example of that. You're abandoning malicious speech. You abstain from malicious speech. You do not repeat elsewhere what you have heard in order to divide people from 
these those people from these people, nor do you repeat to these people what you have heard elsewhere in order to divide these people from those. Okay, that's slander. See, the part they leave out today, I'll read to you in a minute in a description, and you'll see they leave out gossip and they leave out slander because people don't even know what it is anymore. It shows up in so many movies and all around us in books and everywhere around us. Then nobody even knows what gossip is and they don't know what slander is. And thus he is one... He becomes one who reunites those who are divided. He becomes a promoter of friendship, enjoys concord, rejoices in concord, delights in concord is where everybody gets along. That's what concord is. A speaker of words that promote concord. And then he abandons harsh speech. This is the, the last part, the fourth part of that precept is he abandons harsh speech. He abstains from harsh speech. He speaks words that are gentle, pleasing to the ear, lovable as goes to the heart, are courteous to all people, desired by many and agreeable to many. So abandoning gossip, he, he abstains from gossip, speaks at the right time, speaks what is fact only, speaks on what is good, speaks on the Dhamma and the discipline from the five precepts. Um, at the right time, speak such words as are worth recording, reasonable, moderate, and beneficial. And that's where you stop, just stop there. This is all applicable to the five, five precepts. It's a beautiful, complete version. Okay, now you heard the complete version. All right, now listen to what's happening in the books in the bookstore. So what if we haphazardly reduced these precepts to these days so that more people will come and participate with us? This is what's happening when you look around. Don't kill any living being. Well, you have to, then you'll, they'll, they'll have a discussion about let's define a living being and they'll talk about that a lot and decide who's living and who's not. And it doesn't mean bugs and it doesn't mean dogs and it doesn't mean cats and it doesn't mean this, it doesn't mean that. It just means living beings and they'll go that far, meaning human beings. Don't steal. That's all they say. Don't steal. Various countries define stealing very different <laughs> than you or I might think of it. Some cultures um, really go to extremes to say, oh no, that wasn't stealing. <laughs> you wouldn't believe what I've seen in some of the Asian countries over here where the defi di defining stealing goes. You know, one country I decided there's no way we can put a center over here Nobody would be able to hold on to their stuff for 10 days. It's not going to happen. And I gave up. That was before I came to India. India's not really that way that I've seen where I've been anyway. Very nice. People are respectful. Third one, don't have sex without permission. Period. <laughs> no defining anything. Boy, can you go around this one in any direction you want. Now, see, this is where I told you I was gonna I was gonna draw you a picture. So let's go here for just a second and let's draw a picture of what happens when um, what happens when you have um, a, have a sexual act with this person, okay? And you might you may know them for a long time or not. You may have just gotten to the relationship to the point where you want to do this. But are you thinking straight is the question. This is the person. They don't even live, you know, if they live in the parent's house, boy, you're, you're in a lot of trouble because this one is really red. Okay. That's the first circle out from the person. But the big one is if you get in trouble with that person and there is any life that forms or a pregnancy or anything, if you did marry that person, just remember there's also the grandparents here and the aunts and uncles here, and the community here, and over here. This makes a huge difference for the person. 
it's not going to go away. You know, I had a student who, um, <laughs> it's a funny story, actually. This, this man, he didn't, um, the wife's mother did not want this man to marry her daughter. And they really wanted to forbid the marriage, but the two of them got married. Now, here they are eight, you know, so many eight or 10 years later, this was when I met the person. And um, the one thing he could not bear was when they took their two children to visit her mother. And that mother, that mother was so upset because she never stopped criticizing him from the day that he married her daughter. And so he didn't want to go over and even spend time with the grandchildren, with the grandmother. His wife really thought this would wear off, but it never did. And they used to get in arguments and then they'd have to leave and stuff like that. And then I told him, I taught him some basics. The big one I taught him was a very simple one. Anicca. <laughs> I taught him Anicca. And we had a good laugh about Anicca because Anicca, the position of Anicca in the teachings, if you've read a lot of different Buddhist things, Anicca is the cause of suffering. You've heard that all over, right? You've heard it. But here, if I taught him Anicca, I met him again a few months later, and he said, you know, my wife really loves you. And I said, why? And he told me what happened. And he said, you know, since why Why is the whole family love me? I haven't seen you in six months. And he said, the reason is because of Anicca. I said, what happened? He said, well, now I can go over to the mother's house. And the children will play with the grandmother. And if she's nice, I let it go. Because after all, Anicca. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, then I'll get a drink of cold water or some iced tea or hot tea. And I'll sit on the porch with her dog. And we'll just sit out there and they can visit as long as they like. It's not restricted anymore. I said, why not? And he said, because of Anicca. <laughs> and I said, so Anicca is good, huh? And he said, you bet Anicca is good because Anicca is telling us everything is moving all the time and you're never going to be stuck with your mother-in-law again. <laughs> That's what he said to me. And I'm there. That's right. That's right. I did a good job. I didn't think about Anicca that way until he pointed it out to me. And that's the truth. I didn't. So anyway, the problem with the sexual relationship with another person is the age of the person, whether they're living with the parents, if they're out on their own, making their own decisions, it's a little bit different. But you still need to consider what he ran into after he got married and all the suffering that happened those years simply because he didn't understand Anicca meant everything keeps changing. That's why. Okay, then we said uh, we did the lies and stuff. And then the last one is not to take drugs. Now, when it's not to take recreational drugs or alcohol, well, I was in human resources before I came over here. And when I started my business years ago, if you smoked pot or you drank liquor of any kind, even beer, they could detect for a certain period of time. It wasn't a real um, long time. And so people were okay with it. And except for one thing, they started inventing, it was this long, then it got that long, then it got this long, and it helped them reduce how much they paid the insurance company and offered people the insurance. And all of that got involved. And so it became six months long. 
used to be a four weeks and then it was 12 weeks and then it went on and then it was like six months. So the issue is for your own good. It depends on where you want to work. But today, most mid-sized, upper-sized companies or corporations are definitely having on-call drug tests for all employees. It doesn't have to be that you're working on a piece of machinery anymore and they don't want you to get hurt. It goes beyond that to the secretary at the front desk. It's not smart. You're risking everything by getting involved in these things. So that was the part about that. Okay, the third part of the, of the little sutta was, I do not teach a dhamma that is antidotal. <clears throat> I teach a dhamma that has an antidote. What is that telling you? Siddhartha found the answer. He found an antidote. The antidote is synonymous with the word escape. And in life, everything is not cut and dry. It's more like this, you know, and this part down here is the super mundane Nibbana. But we have another space in the text to remember. And this is in... Um, 107, section 2, sutta number 107, section 2. You should be able to memorize this one. I can't memorize any sutta, sister came. That's far too difficult. No, no, I'm telling you, you can memorize this section. It's very simple. It's only one line in the front part of 107, the Ganaka Mogalana Sutta, to Ganaka Mogalana. In the palace of Megara's mother, there can be seen, there can be seen gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress. That is down to the last step of the staircase. Okay. Now, what do you think gradual progress is? when we're talking about getting free from suffering. What do you think? Less and less suffering, the more that you use the escape he found. And what is the escape that he found that is repeated in the text in separate places as right effort and develops into automatically being right effort, which is called right striving. And these two have the exact same paragraph. This one in this sutta for right effort, this one in this sutta for right striving. Same exact, same words. The six R's. Recognize whenever there is an unwholesome mind state in your mind. Release the unwholesome mind state. And then, you know, relax your mind. The relax step isn't mentioned in there, but it's mentioned in the instructions and all over the place for the meditation itself and the objective of your meditation. What is it? The object of your meditation is to let go, let go. What is it? Let go. What was it? Let go. 